I'm out here, you know, I'm just using my, my speed, working up the edge, and I come back for another rep. And so I act like I'm about to get off the ball again. I kind of do a little stutter, stutter step. And Randy Thomas used to always do like this jump set and try to get you quick before you got moving. Bam, inside arm caught him in the air. Boom, back hit the helmet, helmet hit the ground. I said, oh, I killed him. It's one of those things that you probably missed the sack because you're just looking at a guy because how bad you killed him. So that was probably my best rep I ever had. Uh, and I always hold over Randy T's head, head whenever I see him. But uh, you know, so that's probably my best moment. But if you can play one more game, and if you can pick your teammate, any teammate from out of any decade to be on your team for one last performance, who would it be? Let's go behind the mask. Hey, welcome back to another edition of the Behind the Mask podcast. I'm your host, Takeo Spikes, and we got the... Your favorite plus-size model, two-ton reds in the building. <laughs> two-ton reds, the plus-size model. We got another special guest. Absolutely. Special guest inside of the BTM hood over here, my man, Low Alexander. What's going on? What's going on? I used to be a plus size model. I'm the sexy though. You know, I used to be over there, my man. I feel you. I feel you. Yeah, it's, man. It's in a quiet taste. Yeah. <laughs> nah, man. You 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 busy though, bro. Like you put in 15 years. Yeah. Just finished the 15th year. Some of your highlights. We gotta let everybody know. We gotta remind them of how great you are. No, I appreciate right? that. Yeah. So 15 years. Walter Payton, Man of the Year representative for the Buffalo Bills. Nice. You won that award. Yep. Definitely want to get more into that. Two-time Pro Bowler, All-Pro. Um, I think one of the high, the highest compliments that I saw just reading your bio, and I actually saw this when it happened, Brandon being the GM from the Buffalo Bills, oh, he yeah. talked about um, how you just evolved into – this miraculous football player because you play so many positions. Right, yeah. You know, and so uh, um, after the after you guys lost to Houston in the playoffs, you decided to retire. Right. So uh, what? how has it been since you retired from the game within the past few weeks? I mean, it's been great. I mean, it's been the same routine so far, really. I mean, this is the off season, so I really haven't even had the full effect of what it means to retire yet because – Guys haven't reported back to mini camps or off-season workouts yet or training camp or even played games in the 2020 season. And so I think the biggest thing that I'm, you know, getting is used to stop saying when we or us as when I'm referring to the Bills and I'm talking about, you know, what's going to happen next year. So um, those are things I'm working through now. But as far as mentally, I, I feel good about it. I feel at peace. And even when I made my announcement, as I call it, because it wasn't a decision, because I made a decision probably – seven or eight weeks before they even occurred. Um, just kind of going back and forth. Because, you know, when you're playing well and you're doing something that you love, you want to continue to participate. Right. But um, at this stage in my career, kind of doing an evaluation, stepping back from my uh, just my own emotions, just coming down to the reasons why I would come back. And it would just continue to glorify my passion, my wants, my needs, you know, getting pat on the back. Oh, there goes Lorenzo Alexander. Let me get an autograph. Let me play on Sunday with my boys. I love it. I had really nothing to do with my family. And then when I talk, thought about stepping away, it all had about my family. You know, obviously spending time with my wife, coaching my kids, pouring into them, just spending time, taking trips, doing the things that we all grew up wanting to do, but yeah. I had to play a game in order to get the resources to do it. And then sometimes that game becomes, in my mind, almost an idol. And as an older player, I, almost, I had to get ready to get ready and then train and then play and all that just started. My family was here and it just started climbing up. And I didn't like where I was at. And so at this point, or at that point, I was just ready to walk away. And that gave me peace in, in my decision mm -hmm. probably about maybe halfway through the season. Man, that's what's up, man. And, low, we go way back, man. Yeah, I remember man. I, was, uh, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was actually just getting started in Carolina in 05, getting on the field. And we got this guy, Low Alexander, coming in. About the, about the oh, same. No. What oh. position was he playing? Oh, I'm about to yeah. listen. <laughs> First of all, he's probably about what a good 20, 30 pounds heavier. Maybe? Probably more than that. I more was about, 300, about 300, 315 by the time when I what? left Carolina. And, yeah, man. And, and, and was, but they signed him to the practice squad, but the man could hit like a damn bulldozer. <laughs> And I'm block, I'm starting, I'm blocking them. Right, and right. I, you know, I gotta go against Chris Jenkins every day. And, yeah. and then low come in on, you know, he's gonna practice squad at the time, but 
I'm like, man, it's hard to block this guy. He's supposed to be going to practice squad. Why he ain't signed yet? But you went from practice squad D tackle. Right. Then you played D end. Yep. Then flipped on offense and played fullback. Yep. Then played offensive guard. Mm-hmm. Then bumped over and played tight end. <laughs> yeah. What position didn't you play early, man? Probably about quarterback and kicker. That's probably <laughs> it, man. You know, and I was and wide receiver, even though they flexed me out a couple yeah, times. Yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted the ball at least one time. one time. They never gave it to me. All that blocking never wanted to reward me. <laughs> but uh, you know, it was just a um, you know, it's, it's a process of trying to find your niche. And yeah. you know, being cut, being undrafted, um, I realized in order to make it, I had to become I had to humble myself because I think everybody walks into the league with a mindset of, okay, I want to be that guy. Yeah. I want to be the starter. At that time, it was like Dan Morgan or Chris Jenkins yeah, or Brenton yeah. Buckner. Those guys, Pep was on yeah, that team. Yeah. And so, okay, where was an undrafted guy fit in all that? On the practice squad. And mm-hmm. So that humbled me because we all wanted to be that guy, was that guy growing all the way up. And when I got to uh, Washington, um, practice squad again, and just playing all those positions. And coaches were trying to find spots for me to play. And I think – for me, it was just a way to find a niche. You know, you want to play guard? All right. You want to play fullback? All right. Because I want to be paid. I want to be in the league. I want to be a part right. of it. I mm-hmm. didn't want to be at home. I know what that felt like. And like I said, our dream was to play in the NFL. I never grew up saying I want to be the starting linebacker in the NFL. I just want to be in the league and, mm-hmm. and, and participate and play a game that I love. And so I think with the help of, you know, my mom, my uncle, um, kind of bringing that into perspective for me, it made me humble myself. And then eventually, obviously, finding a niche for myself. And then once you humble yourself, you just start attracting people that want to pour into because they see that you want to, you want some information. Right. Yeah. You know, and so guys like Two Time, Buckner, uh, Fletch, uh, I mean, Chris Samuels, Mike Sellers, Rock mm-hmm. Cartwright. I mean, I can go on and on about guys that just poured into my career to where, you know, you fast forward, I'm 15 years later and had a successful career. And so it all started though, you know, just humbling myself on that practice squad, going against cats like that, bettering myself every day and just uh, being appreciative of the opportunity that I had. How many times did you have to put them hands on him? You just, oh, you yeah, just yeah, pushed man. his you know, ass in the ground. Why well, I had to keep his confidence high. You know you got yeah. a guy and they know you got him. Yeah. They say, zo, 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 zo. And that's all I need. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that question. I used to tell Zo. I used to tell Zo. Yeah, all right, we good, we good. We good, we good, we good, we good. Hey, I'm not trying to embarrass nobody, baby. We trying to win on Sundays, you know? So give me the look and I'll slow down. Man, listen, the look, man. He was the brilliant, man. I'm like, yo, y'all see what he out there doing? Yeah, man. That's the crazy. As I got older, I used to tell man, young cat, man, dude, I'll just play the game. Man, chill out. All right, but I, and yeah, yeah, and yeah. They, they don't know what I used to be like when I was yeah, out there just flying around hitting cats. Oh, I'm sorry, man. I didn't to. I'm just trying to, you know, oh, tell me slow down. Oh, trying man. to stick around. <laughs> but, that's, but that's what led to a, a, a 15-year career because of your, your, your dedication, uh, your motivation. Talk about the, the, the perseverance and, and, you know, overcoming them early obstacles in the league. Yeah, I mean, um, for me, and I'll be lying if I say, oh yeah, I was just had this great mentality. It was because of my uncle and my mom to kind of continue to push push me. Cause I mean, I got, was undrafted. I got uh, cut then signed to the practice squad. I mean, I got cut again that next year. And then I was starting to bounce around doing the workouts, had like three or four workouts. And then actually when I got to Washington, um, that was going to be my last one, but, but the only reason I was going to that one is because my mom, all right, man, just push, push through, go to the next one, go to the next one. Um, and so, uh, a crazy story behind that is, is that me and, um, uh, man, what's Alex's last name? I can't think of it. It was another D tackle at the time. We kind of came out, did the workout. They actually chose Alex in the workout. They didn't even choose me in Washington, but he pulled his hamstring. And so I was just the de facto next guy up. And that's how I even got my foot in the door in Washington and stayed there, ended up staying there for like seven years. And so it's just crazy how things work out. But thanks to my uncle and my mom just seeing something in myself that I, I couldn't see and just encouraging me and pushing me and, and not allowing me to give up on myself too early. Yeah, and, and we talked about, I think you are the epitome when you look at reinventing yourself right, yeah. to be able to fit a certain mold. And not only did you reinvent yourself, but you look at when you first got to Buffalo and you look at the situation that the team was in, culture was, you know, I, I can't say it was bad, but it right. wasn't established. Right, right. You know, considering how you left the game, how it is now. Uh, talk about when you first walked into those doors in Buffalo and your maturation progress. And that's where you really became where everybody knew low right, Alexander. yeah. yeah. Well, it was really my first time getting an opportunity to start. And um, I don't even think it was going to start out that way. I mean, Rex Ryan, 
who when I was a free agent, uh, maybe my first time in like 12, he wanted me to come to the Jets, but I kind of turned it down. I didn't want to be in an environment going from Washington, where that was crazy, to the Jets, that was kind of crazy. Um, and, you know, again, being humbled after playing in Oakland, Buffalo was my only offer. So it wasn't like I was going to tell him no again, right? So you go in there uh, with the mindset of playing special teams because that's how I really built my niche in this league is, as far as being a dominant special teams player. And that was his vision for me. Hey, play special teams, be a good veteran. And then kind of through that time, um, I, we had, uh, man, what is uh, Ike? Ike, that was a um, cat that punched Gino in his face. You know Ike? You know what that is? Uh, yeah. I can't uh, think of his last name, but Ike. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was there. He ended up tearing his ACL. And then um, we, Manny Lawson, uh, they decided to go in a different direction and release him. And so here I find myself starting the season off as going to be a special teams guy, kind of thrusted into a starting role and got to play every single snap of defense pretty much. Um, Got 12 and a half sacks that year. And Plus, that was, you were on a one year deal. Yeah, at I was the on time. a one year. Yeah. I was play, I, my, yeah, I played on a lot of one year deals. Yeah. You know, and that's just part of it. And then um, and then I was doing that on top of playing three special teams mm -hmm. units. And so, you know, covering kicks and go try to sack the quarterback and make some plays. On, and, and I was loving it because I never had that opportunity to play that much. And so for me, I always just tell, tell people in Young Cats, you just need your opportunity. Sometimes you have to buy your time. Special teams are a great way to do it. My time didn't come until year like 12 or so mm. to really showcase what I could do, but that's okay. You know, I'm fine with that. If you can buy your time, buy your time. Because there's nothing wrong with playing like a, a Matthew Slater, you know, 12 years in the league, all special teams, all world, seven pro bowlers. There's nothing wrong with that either. Yeah. So all you want to do is play in the league, right? Be right. dominant in that area wherever you can. But opportunity came. I just took advantage of it. Obviously, Rex Ryan's defense is is awesome for a guy like me who's a hybrid versatile guy you think of a guy like um ad who played for me with yeah. the ravens i just saw him and uh just the skill set matched up and so i fit well into a system as far as what he wanted me to do and the rest is history and you landed in buffalo but you were in washington obviously yeah. the raiders the panthers you know yeah the panthers. in arizona for arizona. a couple of years too so talk about the difference in those environments and Outside of starting, which one was the, the most successful for you? I think um, it would come down to Arizona and Buffalo um, from an organizational standpoint, yeah. the way it was structured as far as ownership, front office, coaching staff, and just your auxiliary staff, how, how well they worked together, the synergy that they had. Um, for me, I think um, just the way, uh, especially like how Sean McDermott, uh, I like um, BA too, as far as when I was in Arizona. Just the way they they handled their business was very consistent. You knew what their their structure and their culture was, and they was able to communicate that well to the team. And so, anytime you can have you know those type of factors going on in your organization, and guys know where they need to be, and have a support staff that's going to help them uh, get in the right place, and not have to worry about uh, some of the other things that guys are passionate about, that's when you have the most, I think, fruit. Especially on a when we're talking about longevity, not just no made the playoffs for two years, but four or five, mm. six years in team, and then players want to start going there because of how you've established yourself. For sure. So when you talk about the culture, Sean McDermott. Yeah. I had Sean as a linebacker position coach when I oh, was did in you? Philly. Okay, yeah, yeah. And so I knew when I saw him, he was going to be that next guy. Yeah. Just how he carried himself. He yeah. came up under the Andy Reid mm -hmm. system. But – yeah, his work ethic to prepare, to be able to teach you what he knows. Right. And then to come back and break it down and say, look, I told you this was going to happen early in the week. What are you doing to prepare? Like, when you see what he's done in such a short time period, and you know Buffalo right. hadn't been to the playoffs right. since, oh, God. Yeah, it was 17 years before Seven. we did it in uh, 17. Right. So, so. so, so what... What exactly did he do? What did he bring to the table to help change that culture I mean, you know to what? get you to the playoffs? I mean, he, he, I think he brought himself. He, when he came, and when I say he brought himself, he wasn't trying to be anybody else. Sometimes when you get a head coaching job, you try to mimic the coach you learn from. So he yeah. wasn't trying to be Andy Reid. And you can always tell when somebody's not being themselves. And he was 100% genuine. And he brought, um, I, as you know, he has a wrestling background. You know, was an all-state, all-American style wrestler. So he brought, you know, uh, the discipline, the structure, and the vision um, that our team needed collectively in order to um, be where we want to be as far as making the playoffs. And so obviously that first year, I think we kind of shocked a lot of people. It was kind of a hodgepodge of guys, 
veteran guys, some guys that people didn't want, and we came together. And because some of us knew how to win, we were able to overcome. Mm -hmm. The next year, it really was the start of his first year in my mind because you get the rookie quarterback, you get Tremaine Edmonds, you get some other younger piece, and we have like this youth moment. And we were six and ten. Everybody's trying to figure out, okay, it was same old Buffalo. And then this year, we end up being uh, what ten and six, and uh, getting to the playoffs. You know, we clinched I think two weeks out, which hasn't happened in Buffalo in forever. And so you can start seeing the fruits of his labor of continually to preach his principles. And everything he's all about is about relationships, loving one another, understanding one another, and therefore you're willing to go much further than you ever would for yourself because of the brother next to you, which is oftentimes assumed, mm -hmm. but he's intentional about bringing it up. So he'll have guys come up, share their story, where they came from, kind of like what we're doing right here. Yeah. And then as, as guys talk, you're like, man, I experienced that. I mean, and this could be a white dude from the Midwest and that, you know, I'm from Cali, have no clue, grew up in the hood, completely different backgrounds, but we have a common experience. Yeah. And so now I can go talk to him about that experience and then a relationship can flourish from that something that we have in common. That's dope. And so he's real intentional about creating those type of moments. And so I think that's why our locker room is probably one of the tightest locker rooms that you probably ever would walk into because we've had guys leave and say, we cool, but it ain't like Buffalo. Buffalo. Yeah. You know, and so that's what he's developing there. And he has some great young studs from Tredavious White to Tremaine Edmonds uh, to obviously Josh Allen and a myriad of other guys, Micah High, Jordan Poyer, but some veteran guys sprinkled in there that is going to carry that organization for the next, you know, three or four years. And, and hopefully they become that, you know, that Green Bay Packers, that uh, Patriots style organization where you say, okay, this, this is a winner. I want to show up. I want to be there. Right. And now you retire. You just talked about spending that time with family, which is so valuable. Yeah. And you got two daughters and two sons. Yep. Live, right. Yep. Would you or uh, do your sons love the game like you did? Oh, they love it. Would you let them play football? I'm going to let them play, but I'm going to do it in the in the safest way as possible. Um, I didn't play until I got to high school. Um, that wasn't designed. I was just a big kid. Mm. Couldn't make the weight limit. Put my, out mom, there. my mom wasn't uh, messing with me playing with 12-year-olds when I was 8 years old. I used to have to run around the, <laughs> yeah. I used to have to run around the lake with a trash yeah, bag, bag on yeah. for the See, games they, on to lose yeah, 2 pounds. Right, yeah. At what age? <laughs> I think I was... About 8. You was my age. I was, I was a big kid. You said 8? Yeah. I was 12 because I was like a buck... <laughs> I was a buck fifty, and I was in, you had to be one hundred forty eight pounds, right, to uh, to participate. To participate, yeah. So at eight years old, no, I ain't say eight. I was no one hundred fifty pounds I was at eight. Like, man, what's going on? Oh, bro? Bro. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm morbidly obese, man. Like, nah, man. Nah, you I think I was talking to you. you I was about I was probably about twelve, but I had to run around the lake before yeah. the game for them two pounds. But if I ain't make it. Team would get mad at me because I sit on the yeah. side and eat the sandwich my mother made. I, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, man, later for that, man. If I can't uh, play, later for that, man. Listen, man, it's my fault. They need to scale up the weight or something, man. Yeah, that's crazy, bro. But yeah, I, I would feel funny or weird uh, refusing my or not allowing my sons to do something that they saw their father mm. do to pro to provide for them, have fun with, and then they're. My kids are old enough. My son is nine, uh, one is five. And so they're old enough to go into the locker rooms, come on the mm. field. I mean, one of my sons came to Pro Bowl with me on the pregame field, training camp. I mean, I remember one time me and Larry Fitzgerald tossing my, my nine-year-old back and forth in the air, hanging out with, uh, you know, um, Fletch. Guys are our families. We yeah. see them all the time. So they're like, okay, this is our world. We love it. We are part of it. I mean, they get the, the ultimate fan experience, and then you oh, want me to man. tell them that they developed this love? No, you can't play? No, nah, I, can't, I can't do that as a father. I can't teach my sons to do it in fear. Now, I'm going to educate them as best as I can and organize an environment as far as whoever's coaching them to make sure they're doing it as safe as possible. And then once they get hit, they'll figure it out for themselves <laughs> if they want to keep playing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It takes that one time. Yeah. And so... Just making sure, but obviously, if they got concussions or something that popped up, they, hey, hey, bro, we need to do a different sport at that point because I know the ramifications that we didn't know mm -hmm. back when we were playing that what, what that can lead to. So it's all about the way you do it and the way you uh, facilitate, you know, obviously parenting as a dad and making sure everything is done the safest way. You talk about the way you do it. When we look at Josh Allen, he came in a lot of scrutiny about right. comments that he made in previous times yeah. uh, in college, but he came in as the quarterback. And it was something about him that he brought hope yep. and faith into that Buffalo, restored that to that Buffalo Bills fan base. 
And so now you look at the type of season that he had finishing up this year, going 10 and six, leading you guys to the playoffs. Um, unfortunately, you didn't win the Houston game. Right. And it was certain plays in that game, especially you can tell the lack of not being in situations yeah. like that. Yeah. He panicked. Right, yeah. This is what people were talking about it on Twitter. And I felt compelled to come to his defense because after I saw his press game conference, yeah. he came out and said, you know what? I'm paraphrasing, but he was like, you know, I panicked. Yep. But I put it all on my back right. because I understand and I know I have to do better in these situations. Right. I fell more in love with him at that moment right. because very rarely we hear people step up to the plate right. and say, I did wrong. Put it on me. Yeah. I'll do better next time. What type of leader did you see him evolve into from day one when he walked into the right. locker room all the way up until the day that you left? Well, I think you hinted at it, and and I think he just carried on who he was in that press conference after the Houston game that you said some of the, the, the things and statements that he made when he was 15, 16 years old. And when he had to address that, he didn't run away from it. He addressed it, you know, apologized. You could see the, the, the emotion on his face, how hurt he was. And then when I had conversations with him, you could see the remorse and the growth of a young man and it was all about him attacking um, some uh, uh, wrongs that he had made and, and doing it up front. In the mm -hmm. same way as you can see in the press conference to say he's handling himself the same way that, yeah, I didn't perform as well. Yes, I didn't do what I thought I should have done, but that's not going to define me. I'm going to allow this to energize me and move forward. And he's always done that since day one, since I've known him as, you know, coming in as a young quarterback and just growing every single day. And he has just su such an infectious um, – personality that guys just love being around him. He's not like this prima donna cat sitting off to the side like, you know, that's our, you know, franchise quarterback over there. I mean, he's hanging out with linemen, linebackers, DBs, uh, linebackers. He's he, he's able to move through a locker room with guys from various backgrounds very easily and seamlessly, and it's, and it's effortless. And guys just love him, love playing for him, and love mm -hmm. playing with him. And, and so you see that, and I think he's gained that respect because of the way he has handled – some of the hard issues or times he hasn't shown up um, and played well. Let me talk about this, uh, the star power that Josh Allen is about to have. Right. I got in the league and we had this conversation before. I was starstruck when I finally saw Jerry Rice when I played <laughs> yeah, against him. I'm right. like, Man, that's, that's the GOAT right yeah. there, you know. When you got to the league, did you ever see somebody that you like? Yes. Man, who was, the, who was that person? Pep. He, yeah. Did, yeah, he Julius wasn't quite Peppers. there yet, though, but he was on the cusp of being his, the greatness. I yeah. mean, he might have been year four or five. Mm -hmm. That big six, seven, 300-pound joker walking around looking like that. I'm like, that dude is Julius Peppers. <laughs> dude is dominant, yeah. you know? So that, that was for me because that was my first team, seeing a guy like that, being around a guy like London Fletcher. Mm. Um, you know, so that was always – I was always in a little bit of awe, but once you got to know the guys, to see how down the earth they were, um, just real cool guys that was, um, you know, willing to share information with you and uh, allow you to to learn from from them. So it was, it's always been cool to be around once you really get to know guys. Steve Smith was another guy Steve, yeah, yeah. Uh, for me too. You know, watching him be dominant and then being in the locker room and now we're great friends today. So yeah. it's it's cool to see some of the guys that you aspired to be like or uh, in at least some of their traits as far as on the field success and then become great friends with them uh, just because of that brotherhood and kind of mentorship that that was developed. I remember. When we were in uh, Carolina, Pep was like he came into camp. I think one year like two ninety five. Remember we used yeah. to have to do the combine. We used right. to, have to we had the <laughs> off season. They had us yeah. run forties, forty Thomas for forties in the off season, bro. Oh Jerry, yeah, <laughs> Thomas for forties, man. Pep came in there, ain't worked out the whole year, and ran like a four, what seven four eight. Right. He was like two hundred ninety five pounds. We walked off that field like, man, freak. I'm glad he on our team. Yeah. <laughs> glad he on our team. One on ones used to be hilarious, oh. man. Just tossing guys. Yo. Ah, long on, ah, get out my way, just effortlessly. Hey, it, I imagine it got to the point some old lineman was like, man, I ain't trying to go up again. Oh, you could always see guys shit. What was the funniest oh, thing that you, you saw though when, guys, they, when they didn't want them? You can hear just guys just patting. Just go yeah, ahead. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> man, go get, ahead, man. Get the young got, boys you got going there. Boy, yeah, I already got my rep. I got my rep. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah man. Them, it's always funny. Them, them one-on-ones used to be fun, though, man. We used to go at it. Hey, you got some one-on-ones with two, though? Nah, I never got him. Come on, dog. You got to get well as, some dirt as on As well two, as man. I got my guy. Oh, man, what's my man's name? Uh, 
play guard, play for, you, you would know his name. Um, play for the Redskins guard for a while, was with the Jets as well, Randy Thomas. So mm -hmm. I'm a young boy mm -hmm. and I had Randy Thomas. And you Randy. know, if you know Randy, yeah. he's, if he's loud, always clowning, yeah. just a Southern cat. And uh, I'm just this young guy, second year on practice squad. I think it was in training camp. And uh, I wish I could get this clip. I always say, oh, I'm gonna call the rest and get this clip, put on my highlight video. That's how <laughs> it was. So I'm out here, you know, I'm just using my, my speed, working up the edge and I come back for another rep. And so I act like I'm about to get off the ball again. I kind of do a little stutter, stutter step. And Randy Thomas used to always do like this jump set and try to get you quick before you got moving. Bam, inside arm, caught him in the air. Boom, back hit the hell, helmet hit the ground. I said, oh, I killed him. It's one of those things that you probably missed the sack because you just looking at a guy because how bad you killed him. So that was probably my best rep I ever had. Uh, and I always hold over Randy T's head, head whenever I see him. But uh, you know, so that's let's, probably my best moment. Let's flip it on the other yeah. side. What was that moment to where somebody gave you the business to put, where you knew like So my awakening moment in, um, in high school, because you know, I, I was, you know, Thought I was all world. I was a sophomore. We was going to play uh, Skyline, who was another big high school in my area. And there was a senior over there that was going to SC uh, named Omar Nazel. I don't know if you're familiar. He's a linebacker. Uh, come, he probably came out a couple years earlier than me. So he's like class of 99, something like that. And, uh, and I was playing tackle. He was playing outside linebacker. Thought I was doing something. Went to go run. We was running like a toss. He literally picked me up tossed me backwards and I kind of like hit my butt and scooted it back and I just see the running back running by me. I'm like, my God, that's a grown man right there. Oh, so that was probably the, the biggest time. And then in, um, in the league, special teams, you know, thought I'm the man. It was later in my career though. So I didn't have the same stuff as I did, but um, uh, Roosevelt Nix uh, for Pittsburgh fullback. He caught me pretty good too, coming down in the three. Yeah. And I was on the, in the back in the wedge. It, was, it wasn't the same wedge as it was when I first got in the league, but I thought I was about to go go on and catch him sleeping. He, got, he, he laid me down. <laughs> Boom. Oh, I'm here. Get up quick. Kind of walk off. The coach <laughs> said, you good? I said, I'm good. Okay, if you wasn't a, a vet, man, I, I think I'll take you out the game because you got knocked out. <laughs> yeah, so that was the, the two times I've kind of, you know, been banged up. You know, you always remember those. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got banged up before? Man? I, I got got though. I, you know, everybody get got. Everybody, you, you play yeah. long enough, you yeah, gonna get got. Yeah. yeah. I hate to even bring this <laughs> one up though. <laughs> he thinking about it. Like it's, 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 it's really some bullshit though. For real though. What happened, man? San Francisco. It was uh, my my thirteenth year, and I remember come. It was late in the year. Cat yeah. pulled around on a on a uh, TG scheme. Mm. And uh, the tackle was out, and I'm like, all right, I do this all the time. Like, right, I'm like, I'm right. a, I can murder him. But for some reason, I was just like, why are you trying to do this against your own team? I got caught being indecisive. Oh. So by the time I'm thinking, taking steps, getting close to uh, uh, Shiloh, that was his name, went to USC. Oh, I remember, I remember Shiloh, yeah. Man. Yeah. <laughs> He's a big boy. I'm trying to, I just got caught. <laughs> Next thing I know, <laughs> I just felt my whole body, right, right, boom, hit the ground, right, like jump right back up. <laughs> and the whole team was like, ooh. Yeah, yeah, so the then I look, at, I, look at, I look at Chilo and Chilo was like, you could tell the respect factor. Right, he was right. like, he was like, yo man, you know, you, you, know, I, you, you good man? Yeah, I'm like, bro, yeah, right. I'm gonna get your ass back, back, back. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But, but like, that, that's how it goes though. You play right, long enough. Yeah. And, man. I got caught slipping though. So my time getting laid out. I was uh I was playing special teams. Remember, as you were saying before, when we uh first did kickoff return, the old school wedge, the old school wedge yeah. was cool. It's yeah. just three I'm guys cool. in the in the middle, and then you could like beeline and, and lay one person out. So we was game planning, we was playing the Steelers, and we game planning James Harrison. Remember, he used to play special teams yeah. and run down there early on in his career. So we game playing. It was like, all right, we're going to double him, right? So if you double him, he on this side, two guys on the right double him, and the other guy to the left is singled out. So I'm cool because, you know, I'm in the middle. I'm always going to have a double team unless they kick the ball the other way and we got a right return on, they kick it left, everybody single. Man, James Harrison, B-line, we running away from him. Kick the ball that way, man, to the left. And you already knew you had James Harrison, huh? I knew it. <laughs> 
I ain't want to know it, <laughs> but I got to do my job. So let's talk about. You call it. It's like a it's like a, a, a poison call or something. So that means everybody's just man to man going this way. So I see Harrison just rumbling down the down the hatch. I'm like, shit. He running, look like about a four four, and he about two sixty. I'm like, shit. I'll be all right. So I get over there one on one. I get up to him. I lower my head. Boom. My face mask go this way. <laughs> All I looked yeah. up, I looked up, man. I'm on the floor. I look up. I see him. Where's number? 98? Yeah. Making the tackle. <laughs> <laughs> what, you was looking out your ear hole? Yeah, man. I'm looking out the ear hole on the side of my damn ear hole. I'm like, man, I know this is going to be bad. And you know when you get back to the side, like everybody laughing. The replay going on, everybody laughing. Ooh. And then you got to watch it again in special teams meeting. And what they say when it's about to happen. Oh. Woo! <laughs> man, I was like, man, yeah, listen, rewind man. it, do it again, that rewind. Man, man, it. Knock my damn <laughs> L five out of place, <laughs> up, man. But yeah, man, them them, them hits are serious though. And uh, I that call wasn't it, the first kickoff of the game, was it? Nah, nah, oh, nah. This is this is well into the game, so oh, I was okay. good. But that could be worse because then you you know you got them all game and you're done. Yeah, but I wasn't trying. I, <laughs> what, they, what they say, I ain't want no smoke. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, no James smoke, is right. a monster, man. Yeah, yeah, man. he was. Well, bro, I, I, before we let you get up out of here, we got three questions we like to pose to our guests. Okay. All right. The first one, if you could play, well, not play, you retired now, but if you can play one more game and if you can pick your teammate, any teammate from out of any decade to be on your team for one last performance, who would it be? Mm. I gotta rock with Fletch, man. Gotta mm. rock with Fletch. That's, that's my guy right there. I know London we're gonna get it, yeah, I know we're gonna get it done. That's all we need. Well, what's what's one of the what's one of the biggest intangibles about London Fletcher that that people probably don't know that you want them to know? Ah uh, man, that they don't know already. I mean, he just had an ability. I mean, obviously the lead guys, but his ability to see the game and call a game as he played was was crazy to me because it's hard enough to just figure out tendencies and what you're doing, but to actually know what defenses you need to be and when you should blitz somebody and have all that in your head as well yeah. while you're playing. And that's why he was able to play for so long. It was just, I mean, I've never seen anybody even come close to that 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 uh, football IQ level. All right. If you could travel, next question, if you could travel anywhere in the world, which you can, with that nice payday, them 12 and a half yeah. sacks you got there. Yeah, there. Oh. yeah we saw that. Uh, yeah. So, where would it be and why? Oh, man. I don't really have a clue, man. I'm so. I grew up in, a, in Oakland, so I ain't really get out too much. So, I just like, I, I'm not even a big travel guy. I don't like going to Mexico and cross. I like, I like to feel safe. You go to Berkeley? Berkeley's well, cool. That, that's where you went to school, Cal, yeah, right? Yeah, that's that's cool though. What's that's, what's the other place over there in Oakland? Uh, God, what you it's talking a about? Town. You talking about West Oakland? Not West Oakland, but uh, well, Richmond. Richmond. It's a little shopping area. I don't know. Oakland, you. East Mount Mall. Oh, I know about East. Mount. Yeah, okay. I ain't never oh, been. No. Yeah. <laughs> you know oh, what? Man. I would probably go to. Um, uh, Turks and Caicos, so, somewhere like that. I want to be in one of them huts where you can just jump off your your uh, pier in the morning when you wake up and yeah. go swimming. Right on. Yeah, right on. I like that. I'm trying to get that, you know, set up. That, but that's an expensive trip though, too. Listen, man. I'm in a I'm in you a different. Got it, nah, dog. Nah, you man. good, bro? You know, I got a fixed income now. You know? <laughs> so, so, unless y'all trying to give me a job, anyway, <laughs> jump on with y'all, man. Sure. Well, come on, bro. <laughs> Last one I got. If you could go back, knowing what you know now, if you can go back and spit some knowledge to a younger version of yourself, let's say a oh, teenager, wow. what would be, what would that comment be to yourself as a younger version? Man, there's so much, man. I, I mean, I think people think I was just innately driven to work hard. I probably would even go back even earlier than that. Because I remember to just tell you a quick story and why I would talk about just the work ethic and what it's going to take and you're not the world is much bigger than Oakland and the people you see around you is probably what I would talk about. Mm -hmm. I just remember this one time, I, you know, all stars, I was like maybe 10 or 12 playing baseball. And I just thought I was just 
all that in the bag of chips and and uh we had to run some laps and you know every time we get to this one uh wall i would just kind of walk behind it and then so my uncle's my coach and so he kind of snuck down there kind of knowing what we was doing and saw me it's like hey boy you need to run I'm like man i ain't running no you need to run man make me run and so he literally dragged me in front of the rest of the team and he ran and, and had me on my back and just pulling my leg dragging me <laughs> that's the type of dude i grew he was like my dad so um, but that kind of catapulted me into understanding how I needed to work. And because we were running, I think, because somebody else, some somebody that wasn't good messed up or something, we had to run. And so talking about team and being accountable to your team, even to the person that's not as good as everybody else, um, but really just my work ethic. And so making sure that I worked hard all the time, regardless of how well I thought I was, my talent, because that only goes so far. But just being, you know, internally or intrinsically driven to be great. And I would say, you know, try to create that and be intentional about that at a much earlier age, um, because that would, I think, help me. Because when I got to high school, I don't even think I knew it in college. I mean, I, I think I tricked off being a higher draft pick, you know, just partying, doing stuff that really didn't matter in the long run because I had a little bit of freedom. And so I'd, I would have really just honed in on that and start that at a younger age. So when I did get my freedom, I would have had the discipline to still do the things that I need to do to achieve um, the goals that I had set out for myself. Oh, that's dope, bro. Started with humble beginnings, 15 year NFL career, Pro Bowls, All Pro. We talked briefly about Walter Payton Man of the Year. Yeah. Tell the people what does that mean to you? Um, I mean, it's a huge honor, obviously. I mean, getting to uh, know uh, Jared and Brittany, who are uh, Walter Payton's kids, you get a, a sense of who he was as a man. And obviously, family was very important and service was. And so um, just to be associated, uh, with his name and what he meant to the game and really to the communities that he served is is just awe-inspiring, given the fact where I started in this league and mm -hmm. just how I developed. And, and it was mainly because out of people that I, I came in contact with, um, like I keep saying London Fletcher, Kyle Williams, Larry Fitzgerald, guys that embodied that and was willing to give me some piece that I could take and make my own. And so it's been really cool to now have that platform to be able to give back because I understand the importance that or the importance of giving because I received so much starting right. at a young age from my uncle that I just mentioned, my mom, countless coaches, and the numerous of players and coaches that at some point made a, a, a real impact on, on me as a player, but more importantly as a man. And so um, to be associated with that legacy and to can hopefully continue to do that even once I'm beyond this game um, is a huge honor. That's dope, bro. Yeah. Real. <laughs> but to that. You, you good? Yeah. Hey, uh, appreciate the time that you gave us. Oh, yeah, always. And it's uh, like, like I'm looking forward to seeing what you're doing next. Yeah. I know you, you know you say you don't <laughs> like to go go places much, but, man, kick your feet up. No, I hear that. Like, you deserve it, bro, for yeah. real. No, I appreciate and the thing that. that I appreciate about it more than anything, I played in Buffalo. Yeah. And we were close to getting over the hump going to the playoffs. We didn't. But to see you come in and your leadership and what you gave to the younger guys, that's what it's all about. No, I appreciate that. You know what I mean? That. So well, by you coming in, you yeah. truly left Buffalo in a better place than when you first found it. So yep. much respect, my brother. Oh, yeah, man. Appreciate, appreciate you guys you, as always, well, bro. Yep. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Behind the Mask Podcast. Indulge, share, and subscribe to quality content. And we're everywhere. We're on YouTube. Make sure you scroll to the bottom. Click that little bell for notifications. We're on Google Play. We're on Spotify. And we're on Apple Music. Even on social media, we're going to make it easy for you. Follow at the BTM Podcast for your weekly fixings. And remember, there's only one rule. There are no rules. Let's, Let's go, go behind, behind the mask. mask.